What about people with complaints? You've talked about the potential, the possible pleasures, the possible bliss, assume it exists. What about people with complaints? Um, a Muslim, uh, even a, a person from a, a well illuminated person from another religion, even people in, without a religion would tell you don't look at the Part, half part of the glass that's empty, look at the half that's full. People of religion would look at the gifts that they can find, that they can count. For example, it's been said that good health, sane, safe health, is a crown on the head of healthy people that is seen only by people who are afflicted. You're in good health. It's a crown. You're not looking at it. We only get to feel it the most when we miss it. How many things would it get me to miss to realize how much of my cup was empty? Again, also, how many ills do I have to remember around me that did not afflict me. You tell me, what about them? What about the person who has absolutely nothing to count for, nothing to thank for? You tell me you have absolutely nothing to thank for, I'll say, come on, okay? One thing you can thank for is that you are able to do this objection. This is the freedom that no human being would allow to be taken from him, the freedom of thought, the freedom of expression. If you do not appreciate that as a great gift, we have a problem. I can solve it. I'll give an example here. Uh, a great scholar, contemporary star, scholar of Islam, called, uh, whose name is Ali al-Jifri, from the descendants of our prophet, extremely beloved and popular in the Islamic world, mentioned about his, one of his teachers who was bedridden in the last stages of his life, probably paralyzed, beloved by students, of all ages, visited by them frequently, who frequently would ask them, him to read to them from the Quran with the purpose of getting cured themselves from some sicknesses or others. We do that. Our prophet used to do that, and we do that. Uh, that will be another issue altogether, praying or reciting the Quran for healing purposes or not. The issue here is that Habib Ali, Sheikh Ali Jifri, said, I asked him, you pray for others to heal, but look at yourself. You're all sick, meaning bodily. Uh, he meant probably start asking God for yourself and many Muslims, even during many ages, would do that. And many have healed miraculously. People in my family have. Some have healed from cancer. Some have healed from paralysis in their leg. Close relatives. We don't see that as a miracle of uh, stop the whole world. This is what happened. A million people will go outside a court. Look what happened to this guy, a miracle. For Muslims, it's just another day in life when this happens. <coughs> uh, Al-Jifri's uh, teacher answered him. 
He said, my heart is sane from objection. Meaning, in his case, that man's specific case, reached one of the utmost states in Islam. For him, he saw the achievement in his life is to be a Muslim in the actual meaning of Muslim who gave in to the the to the um, to what has been ordained by his Lord. Probably he took some medicine here, he took some medicine there, it didn't work. Uh, after that, his heart was sane, safe from objection. I believe this man definitely is happier than most of us. Uh, comes to my mind, one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, most probably Salman al-Farisi from Persia. He was a slave, then was liberated with the assistance of the Prophet, commercially liberated, meaning uh, having to work, gather the money, repay his master his own price to get liberated. I believe that was him, but the story is definitely one that I read concerning one companion who heard news that two or three of his children died. People were coming to provide him condolences. Now, let's notice something. We're not talking before the death. We're saying something happened that nobody can change. I cannot bring her or him back to life no matter what I do, once a person is dead. That's one issue. Another issue is grief and pain is human and does happen. The Prophet, peace be upon him, lost his son. He died in his own arms. He was, his, he was tearing. The companion said, what's this, O Prophet? He says, these are the tears of mercy meaning not the tears of objection, revolt. That companion had the same thing. When people were con providing him condolences, it seems some of the condolences were veering toward a meaning of objection. He said, but I am accepting. He said, how? He said, how come if my Lord wanted their death at this moment, would I want it to be different? This is a high state. I cannot ask myself today to reach that level. But, it, but to be honest to myself, I have to accept that it is an extremely high level of connection between a man and whoever he accepts as his creator. We're talking about the purpose of life, a great purpose of love and worship, but why now these ills, the pains? We said that some have to do with people who are uh, very much in a good accord with their creator. The prophet said, the most afflicted among you are the prophets. By the way, as you have noticed, this is a very delicate lesson. You have given it all the attention. It concerns the extremely crucial points of our existence. It's delicate for me, too. When I read it, I try to again benefit from what has been copied by me. Our beloved prophet said, the most afflicted among you are the prophets, then the next best, then the next best. He continues, thus one is afflicted according to his religion. In Islam, when we say a religion deen, we mean his relationship with Allah. Maybe Christians would call it faith. But faith has a stricter meaning. Let's continue. The prophet said, thus one, that's a person, is afflicted according to his 
relationship with God, to his faith. So, if there is strength in his religion, his affliction will be stronger. And if there is delicacy, vulnerability in his religion, in his way of believing, now look at the most merciful. He will be afflicted according to that. The prophet continues, so affliction remains with the subject until it leaves him walking on earth with no sins, meaning with no sins that have not been compensated for. We will see soon that sins com are compensated for by forgiveness, total forgiveness, when Allah wants to, our Creator can and does, but also can be compensated for by any hardship that may occur in life. The Prophet says, anything that displeases man takes away his sins, even a thorn in his leg. Anything that displeases you compensates for something. It's not a punishment. It takes away. If you did the sin, you need to be directly forgiven or pay for it in the hereafter, or in this life have undergone, according to the definition of our Prophet, some disagreeable moment, even a thorn. That was an authentic hadith. Another hadith of importance to this subject, the Prophet says, if a level for the subject, meaning the, the subject of Allah, the slave of my creator, if a level for the subject is preordained for him from Allah, but which he did not acquire through actions, where my actions have failed, haven't reached a level that has preordained beyond time, before creation, this man will be created, will reach belief, accept God, follow his commands, but not be active enough. Yet, knowing all that, before time, since eternity, that person's state level in the hereafter has been decided for him. By bounty and generosity of Allah, it's usually higher, always higher, much higher than what we hope for. If a level for the subject is preordained for him from Allah, but which, which he did not acquire through actions, Allah will afflict him in his body, family, and wealth, then provide him patience for that. Meaning, don't be afraid. Oh, if I'm going to become a believer, does it mean I have to believe that I'm going to start getting afflicted? No. If he afflicted somebody, remember Jifri Sheikh, he is afflicted, hardly, but he has been provided with a patience and acceptance that makes him, I repeat, definitely happier than the most of us. If such a thing happens, God also provides the required good attitude. We have a, a nice popular saying that says, God afflicts but helps at the same time. Then provide him patience for that until he obtains this level. Narrated by Abu Dawood, this is a good hadith. I understand that this here opens attacking Islam and the acts of worship of Islam. It is not by prayer and fasting and stuff that you enter paradise. Muslims confirm it officially, formally, according to hadith according to logical proofs based on hadith and textual uh, sources that entering paradise is by the mercy of God. And many scholars explained, based on the previous hadith, that the assigned levels, although also by the mercy and giving of Allah, he created paradise, he created the levels. The placement in these levels of mercy given by him is according to our deeds. 
To clarify it further, from the hadith, our Prophet said, try to aim correctly and rightly, and know that none of you enters paradise through his own deeds. I don't need a person from the 20th or 16th century squeezing his brain to tell me something about that meaning. I have beautiful words from a great prophet saying, try to aim correctly and rightly and know that none of you enters paradise through his own deeds. They said, not even you, O Prophet of Allah. He said, not even me, unless Allah submerges me with mercy from him and bounty. Our teacher, when relating this hadith, put his hand on his head. We have a blessing from God to be able to listen to a hadith from a person who listened to it to another person up to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Many instances of many hadith describe how the Prophet put his hand this way or that way or this way. These are lovely words denoting something we need to know concerning the mercy needed by us, concerning the true humility of the most outstanding person in creation. He said, not even me, unless God submerges me, not touches me, no, 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 submerges me with mercy from him and fadl and extra abundance. Meaning, not only mercy, I need a lot, a lot, a lot of mercy myself, the Prophet, to enter paradise. This is what we Muslims believe. His words are the reason for our love to him. Such a person, the more you know about features like that, there is no way but to love to know more. Gandhi said, I'll say from memory what I remember because it's appropriate here. He said that after having finished his biography, he wished there was more. That's what I was saying, that when you read good features from such a man, you want to know more. Gandhi was a great man, Muslims, uh, unlike what uh, some people have uh, projected the image of, uh, the uh, morals of Muslims is to appreciate good morals, even from people who don't share their religion. Reviewing history, you'll find it. Review probably uh, what happened between Salah Din, you call it Saladin, Salah Din Ayyubi and Richard Lionheart, who were fighting each other, and many accounts have been related about very amicable, honorable, generous behavior between the two. That's another issue. Now, here we're talking about a hadith that mentions something that happened to Moses. How can that be? Two ways. It could be already in the Bible, in a way or another, and it could be absent from the Bible. But what we have here is a narration from people 1400 years ago who have met tribes among the Jews who were coexistent with them in Saudi Arabia and later when Jordan, Syria were also, um, uh, were also open to the, to the Muslims who contained priests and uh, Jewish um, rabbis and Jewish religious people. There was a lot of interaction between them. So uh, such stories are possible from these two. They were very common to the point that our prophets uh, uh, decreed concerning them. He said, do not belie people of the book, meaning just don't, if you read about people of the book, meaning Christians and Jews, don't accuse them outright, outright of lying because they have a true book. But, do, but you need to follow my law. Al-Bayhaqi and Al-Hakim narrated that Prophet Moses passed by a man in a worship shrine of his. Then Moses, peace be upon him, 
passed later, finding that the beasts had tore his flesh, a head thrown, and a liver thrown. He said, peace be upon him, Moses. He was a caring person. He said, O Lord, he was obedient to you. Yet you afflicted him with that, in that type of death. Moses, uh, as far as Muslims read narrations about him, was a man, not only a prophet, not only a leader, was a man of action and strong but commendable temper that would say such a word to our Lord. Yet you afflicted him with that. He was a daring person in the truth that he saw. He dared. He was not being insolent. God revealed to him. He asked me a level that he did not reach through his actions. So I afflicted him to make him reach that level. Now, remember the atrocities performed by Romans against Christian saint believers being chewed up by lions. For all accounts of history, are people who, at the uh, wonderment of people like Richard Dawkins, they would say when calamities happen, we only see the faith of people increase. We don't know why. Richard Dawkins is honest about wondering why. I do not wonder why. I deduce directly the link between these persons and their creator was unshakable. The link of love, of worship, was unshakable. Our prophet said, a martyr, these are my tires, does not feel from the pain of death except a pinch. All these hadith concentrate on a mercy from God, despite, according to his decision, his possibility to forgive for nothing. Another possibility is for him to decide to grant a person more in the hereafter based on his actions, if not, based, again, based on forgiveness, if not, based on some afflictions. In this life, God has created the creation with a law of causality, cause and effect. So it will be in the hereafter, and so the law of causality of the hereafter as dictated by God and conveyed by the prophets, is a law also that determines the placements. Viewing, none will enter paradise, but through the blessing of God. Every single atom here and in paradise is through the mercy of God and the gift and bounty of God, yet the pleasures in this life and the hereafter are also subject to the decisions of God, whether gratis, for free, or whether depending on something, action, physical, and gratis, I must point out, does not mean whimsical. Gratis is when it is not through a physical hardship, physical deservedness, it is then left to something that went on inside. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, be sincere in what you do, then a little will suffice. That's, for example, one hadith that explains how a person who was not able to do much is able to compensate for that and get away from hardship. How? Become more sincere. Be sincere in your actions, then a little will suffice you. The other hadith says, if a state has been prescribed, preordained, whereby the actions of the person can't reach it, he might get afflicted. The other measurement is sincerity in my behavior with God. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, 
how many a single unit of prayer are worth more than a thousand? He definitely is pointing to a single unit with sincerity is worth more than a thousand units. We are not being sincere to God. Uh, other hadith exists on the same meaning. Uh, والحمد لله رب العالمين.